as a lesson learned. So I, I came back uh, in 2016, I believe, and gave this talk, and a lot has changed since then. I've updated some of this research I've done. Um, I'm unveiling, uh, not unveiling, but I'm demonstrating this tool that I built. Um, so with that in mind, I know that they don't have the best lighting in this room. So real quick, uh, here is where you can find uh, these slides. Um, they're already um, viewed, or excuse me, they're already live on my website. So feel free to go check them out there. So something about me, so I'm a cyber operations officer. I'm also a technical mentor for Node SC, which is a local nonprofit in Charleston that focuses on entrepreneur or teaching entrepreneurship, uh, cybersecurity, and information technology to high school students, college students, and just the local community. Uh, I'm a code monkey. I code in a lot of different languages. I am by no means a developer, um, but these are just some of the things that I've had to learn, not only through uh, my time here at College of Charleston, so I graduated in 2016, uh, but also some of the projects that I've been working on over the last X years, 10 years. Uh, I like to build a lot of Legos, and I'm currently trying to make a, be a perfect old fashioned, which has still eluded me to this day. Good right? Uh, so in, in, doing, in doing this talk, this started off as a, as a professional development for one of, one of the soldiers that works with me. Um, However, he is not here right now. He is in another country uh, called away on business. So you're stuck with me. Uh, and also, uh, this is a, in case you're wondering who this handsome devil is right here. This is Clyde the Cougar. He's a mascot at College of Charleston. Uh, this is me as, the, as uh, the mascot at College of Charleston when he got his class ring. His name is Clyde. So I put a photo of Clyde up there because you know what I look like because I'm standing in front of you. Um, so here's our roadmap. So, uh, we're going to talk about what is XXE and what can we do with it. Uh, the different types or the different XXE attacks um, and the types that um, that there are that you can use in just general pen testing. Uh, but to understand XXE, you have to understand XML, right? So uh, just a quick down and dirty discussion on that as well, um, and then uh, a demo using our tool uh, Doulos. So Doulos is the Greek god of tricks and trickery, so that's where that comes from. Uh, next, we'll talk about the, the defense against XXE uh, after, and some limitations of XXE, right? So depending on how you use your attacks, uh, how you actually attack a web app or um, some other thing that parses XML files, um, we'll, we'll talk about those limitations. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about our red, blue, and purple teams and how they can use SXE and then open it up to questions. Questions are authorized through any portion of this uh, talk, so feel free to just blurt them out. Um, so the key takeaways, right? So if you don't get anything else from this, uh, the three things I want you to get away from it, uh, take away from this is understand XML and how it's used for good and bad. Um, understand how web applications are exploited using XXE. And then lastly, I want you to understand and see the attack through the eyes of the red team, the blue team, and the purple team. So the red team uh, is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> this talk is more red team based. Um, however, uh, in my work as, a, as working in security operations centers and working in offensive security, uh, there there isn't a very good blend of the two, right? So this idea of purple teaming isn't new, um, but it's not, it's starting to become adopted. So people are starting more, to, more and more to talk about it. So I would like for the red teamers to really look, not through the eyes of the red team of how I can use this in my toolkit, you can always do that later. Uh, look through the eyes of the blue team. So what artifacts am I leaving behind? Uh, how can I be detected in this, right? And then the blue team members, this is how, this is one way, one of, you know, probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of ways uh, web apps can become exploited, right? So, uh, so let's go to the beginning. What is XXE and how do we use it, right? So XXE, by definition from OWASP, is an XML external entity attack uh, against an application that parses XML input, right? So this attack occurs when an XML input containing a reference to an external entity is processed by a weakly configured XML parser. So weakly configured XML parser is the, the key you know, to this whole attack, right? So, uh, so what does that mean, right? So uh, at you know, its basic level, you craft some XML payload, right? 
and then this payload is pushed to an XML parser, right? So an XML parser could be written in Java, PHP, uh, really anything that can handle and take in input, uh, XML input, and then output, you know, something, uh, can do some function, can do some thing, period, right? Uh, the parser will then interpret that payload, that's that thing, uh, and then pwnage, whatever, whatever that payload was crafted and designed to do. Right, so some of the attacks you can do. Um, remote code execution is number one, however, it's extremely unlikely. Um, just in modern web apps, you're not really gonna see this, but if you're going through this XXE route and you wanna test this out through a file upload feature or some other thing, um, it's a simple, quick check to see, um, especially if it's a PHP application, just check to see. Um, I forgot the, the, the library, or excuse me, the, the function, but um, you know, if it comes back that it's there, you know, that's, that's a strong indicator. Um, next is denial of service, so the billion laughs attack. So it's really just an entity that calls another entity um, that within that entity that was called, there might be, you know, um, uh, like seven A's, right? And then the, the second entity is calling that one four times and then the third entity is calling that one four times. So really you see how it can just become exponential, right, just DOS it. Uh, next is server-side request forgery. This is, I want your web app, I want, I want you web application to go grab something and go do something, pull something, demonstrate something, show me something, but I want you to do it running as yourself or another thing or, or another, um, with another permission set uh, I don't want you to tell anybody. I don't want any, anybody else to know. Um, and then when you get that information, just display it to me only, right? Excuse me. Next is directory traversal. So this is just, you know, navigating the directory, seeing what's there, getting a lay of the land, essentially. Uh, port scanning is self-explanatory, and then local remote um, file inclusion, so seeing what files are there. Uh, so next, let's actually start talking about XML, right? So XML is just an extensible markup language. It's derived from HTML, which is a standard generalized markup language. It's, it falls from the same family of HTML. Um, so uh, it's really the, the HTML is the international standard for defining markup to describe the structure of different types of electronic documents, right? HTML being one of them, so actual web pages. Uh, it's software and hardware independent, and it's extremely lightweight. So there's a simple misconception, which you'll see here in the next couple slides where I'll actually show you what a very simple XML file looks like. But it looks extremely like HTML. But the, the core focus and the difference between the two is that XML holds data, whereas HTML's job is to display data, right? So couple displaying data with CSS style sheets and then you've got a pretty, hopefully, if you know how to style, um, you know, website. Um, so, uh, so what uses XML, right? So we have Microsoft Office products, so this is spreadsheets, Word documents, PowerPoints, uh, Apple iWork, OpenOffice, LibreOffice, are you seeing a trend? So like all of these Office documents have adopted this new standard, um, which is the OpenOffice standard. Uh, SVG images are also XML, so if you were to really look at these things, you would see XML. Um, structures and, and data. Uh, X HTML and XCSS is HTML and CSS written in XML. It was a matter of time. Someone was going to build it and find some use for it. Um, HTML5 derives from um, X HTML and XCSS. Um, the RSS and Atom feeds are also XML. And then you can also use XML through SOAP and REST web services. Right? So with all this background knowledge, now let's actually talk about classifications, right? So XML has two classifications. It's either valid or it's well-formed. So um, all XML files must be well-formed. So well-formed means that there must be a root element. So um, in the next slide you'll see uh, I will have a root element. So it's one element that houses this entire file. It could be note. It could be file. It could be whatever you want it to be. Doesn't XML doesn't care as long as it sees that this is the root and this is where the root ends, right? Yes. So it's like a database contains tables, which contains L attributes of elements and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
so then, uh, again, if it has a root element, obviously it has to have a closing tag. So if you have an open tag, you need a closing tag, right? Just simple HTML. Uh, tags are case sensitive and must match, right? Uh, they must be properly nested. Um, so exactly what you were saying earlier. And then all attribute values must be quoted, right? So um, if I say that this is going to be a string of some sort, that string needs to be quoted so it can be interpreted as such. Uh, XML does not require document type definitions, but they can and must definitely do use them. So the exploit that you'll see today, um, the proof of concept today, you'll, you'll see that I am using a, a document type definition. Um, and well-formed just means your XML follows correct syntax. So this is the basic syntax. There's a couple more rules. Um, if you want to go check out and actually read uh, the manual and the work group that developed XML, if you are one of those people, um, then I have uh, the, the final slide that's also on my website has all these resources that you can go do for further reading, right? Um, next is the valid, right? So valid is what happens when you have a document type definition. So if you declare, and actually I think this might be a little bit simpler, um, if you declare this document type definition here, right, uh, XML doesn't even try to guess what it is that your, the structure of your file uh, or whatever is parsing your XML code, right? So it says, oh, you have a document type definition. Well, let me go to this document type definition and understand how you're structuring your code here, right? So I know what all of this is. So I see an element of note should have a to, from, heading, and body um, section in it, right? So note here being the root element. Um, and then the element to, from, heading, and body is PC data. PC data just stands for parse character data. Um, it just says what's there, print it. Like if, if you can understand the characters within it, uh, XML supports Unicode. So um, just go ahead and print it, right? So going back here is the exact same thing that I showed here. The only difference is, is that there's no uh, DTD. Right. So um, again, like I said, you don't need a DTD, but you're leaving it up to chance for whatever's parsing your XML file to understand XML and make, and make sure your stuff is written well. Right. So here we have um, a declaration of the XML version um, of 1.0. So for my first candy bar, what is the latest version of XML? You take a guess. 1.1. Who said that? You got it. So you can come take your pickup candy up here, whatever one you want. Because if I throw it, I'll just I'll nail you, and it it, or I may miss you completely and hit the person to your left. Um, so here you can also set the encoding. So you got UTF-8, UTF-16, um, and then the the standalone. So standalone means there's nothing else. There's no dependencies anywhere. You don't need to go search for it. It's all right here, right? So then we have our note, which is our root, and then to from heading and body. So we have a note from Aubrey to Kiki with a question asking, do you love me, right? So uh, again, well-formed example. Valid example is the exact same note. The only difference is, is that I am explicitly stating what each of these elements are, right? So again, if it's well-formed, well then it's good. If it's valid and it passes the check, then it's automatically assumed to be well-formed. Does anybody experience in the room see an issue with this? It's automatically assumed that it's well formed, right? So now let's start getting into the actual XXC exploitation, right? So there's three types of attacks. You got in-band, bl blind, and out-of-band. So you might hear these terms, you know, used around um, when talking about exploitation. So in-band, um, you can essentially think of this as it's... Um, within the same browser or terminal window that you're shooting code to, right? Um, blind is uh, you're, all you're going to get is an error. So then at that point, you're blind. You, have, you don't know. You only know the errors that you're getting back. And through enough errors, hopefully you'll be able to get a lay of the land and understand the application that you're dealing with. Uh, lastly is the out-of-band. So um, you may upload a file for something, or you may push, like through a curl, push something to your server, to your web server and uh, not get anything back from that same terminal window, but you might have a, an NCAT or NETCAT listener um, that's waiting for a connection back, right? So again, here's an in-band. So this is an example I just grabbed off Google Images um, of an XXE attack using Burp Suite, 
right? So we crafted this payload, it sent some stuff up to, to get the empty password file, um, and then it was, the server responded to this within the same window using quotes, right? Um, next is uh, example two is blind. So they try to do the exact same thing again. They just sent some random cat, um, just arbitrary commands to the server, just let me see what I get back. And then you get some error and then some UID that gets back, right? Bless you. Uh, and then lastly, you get out of band, right? So here we have this Etsy password file um, that is sent using this login form here. And then this is supposed to represent like a Netcat listener or a terminal of some sort. So uh, here's my callback. And then we get to the fun stuff. So demo with Dulos, right? So I made a small sacrifice to the, uh, you can't see that. So I made a small sacrifice to the demo gods last night. So hopefully this works. If it doesn't work, it's all good because I recorded this. All right, cool. So um, here we're gonna walk through uh, Dulos real quick. So uh, I presented this at B-Size Augusta and I had like some super cool font that had like ghosts and stuff. That's why this is orange. I had like ghosts and stuff coming off of this, this ASCII art because everybody loves ASCII art, right? Um, also, fun fact, uh, I had a web server. I was telling the other speakers today. I had a web server that um, I, my original payload was a dot, .docx file, so it was just a Word document. Uh, and it worked, and then two months later, it decided it didn't want to work anymore. And I spent like a week or two trying to figure this out, figure this out, and then I said, all right, I gotta pivot, I gotta find something else. So then uh, me and Miller came up with this uh, .txt file, and then we just threw this in here and made it experimental, because <laughs> we're still playing with it. Um, I did not, so this tool is on GitHub. Uh, it's private right now, I forgot to set it to public, so probably within the next day or two as I travel back to where I'm going, uh, on my flights, I'll make this public so you guys can poke around and look at my terrible code. Um, so anyway, so we're gonna create an XML.txt payload, right? So we're gonna choose two. And what is the IP of your server that is hosting your DTD? So um, I'm just gonna do a Python simple HTTP server um, on my local machine. So that's the IP of it. What is the listening port of your server that is hosting your DTD? By default, that is 8,000. Uh, what is the IP you want the victim server to call back to? So again, that's gonna be the same IP. And then what is the port? 1337, because we're leaked, right? So now we've got, uh, it creates our payload, spits out where, you, where it's saved, and then same thing for your DTD file, right? So now we're gonna move to our payloads folder, do an LS, and here uh, we're looking for this actual payload.txt, which is right here. Awesome, no errors, right? So now, uh, now we're gonna actually start um, our Python simple HTTP server. Um, so something else to note, so um, me and Miller also decided to do this to build our developer chops back up, because I haven't coded in a while, and he hasn't coded in Python in quite some time also. So he wrote it in Python 2, Got seven, and then I started playing in Python 3, and we couldn't figure out why it wasn't working for either of us, and then after some finagling um, in the Python environments, we finally figured out, like, oh, you're using Python 2 syntax, and I'm trying to run it in Python 3, and it's just not working. Uh, so I said, all right, we're at our first crossroads. What do we do, right? Do we make it backwards compatible, or do we force people to new standards? Uh, we chose to do, we chose to force people to new standards, but if you use a Python environment, it's super simple to switch it, right? Um, so now we have a Python server that sets up, also fun fact, when you set up your Python server, uh, wherever directory you set that Python server is now your root directory for your web server. Didn't know that, so found that out, which is super fun. Um, it's like, why is it not finding my DTD? Oh, how do I set a direct root path? Oh, this is how you can do it, right? So that was fun. Uh, next, we're gonna set an, in, uh, an incat, um, set it to verbose, so show me everything on the screen. Um, set it to listen on port 1337. Awesome, so now we have incat listening on port 1337, willing to accept anything that comes its way. 
cool. We're now staged for this proof of concept for this attack, right? So now, let's, we're in our payloads folder. So now we will curl this payload or curl the payload.txt to this IP address, right? So my machine is gonna push this file to the web server for it to interpret. So what's on the back end is just an extremely simple um, PHP um, XML um, parser, uh, and it's just waiting for XML to get parsed, right? So now we're gonna run it. So it's now, uh, curl is waiting for a call for something to come back, right? And it's not gonna get it. Um, here, uh, here again is our server, so if we had an Apache, we went back and looked at our Apache logs or whatever, um, whatever other web um, platform you're using. Uh, we see that we get a git for evil.dtd, um, and we get a 200. That's exactly what we wanted, so it grabbed the, two, it grabbed the DTD. Uh, next, you get a whole bunch of gibberish, um, and then we see we now have a callback from um, somewhere, I think it, yeah. So we get a, a, we get a connection from uh, dot 131 on from port 47098 and then we get a base 64 encoded string. Uh, super awesome. So what do I do now? Well now you can go into Python, right? Import um, base 64, right? So we're gonna import the base 64 library and then base64.b64 decode. And now we're gonna decode this base64 string. And now we have the Etsy uh, password file of this, um, of this machine, right? So Looking back now, I guess it's important to note that our payload was supposed to grab the Etsy slash password file um, of this machine, but uh, that's arbitrary. That could be the Etsy shadow file. That could be, you know, really any file that you wanted. Um, so with that, proof of concept works. This parser is vulnerable to XXE, right? So now let's go back to our talk. All right, so we just demonstrated this tool that does this thing that will be public later, um, and it now you know rains from the heavens. Everybody's high-fiving each other, right? Red team did their job. Offensive security is cool. Um, so, what does this mean for your for your defenders, right? Well, in with this defense that you're about to see comes limitations of this exploit, just with any other type of exploit. It always has its weakness, its Achilles heels. So, XML parsers can break if they don't understand the characters they encounter in your XML slash DTD files, right? So, in developing the perfect payload to craft for this tool, it's why is my payload not being crafted? Like, why, why is my exploit not working, right? Um, and it goes through trial and error of perfecting, um, you know, your actual payload stuff, right? So, the code that you're actually putting in there. So C data is another way, is similar to, to PC data, but it just says um, if I have, if I wanted to grab a file that had characters in it uh, that could not be parsed through HTTP, whether they be escape characters or something, um, you know, and it, I only get partial or nothing because um, HTTP is just like, I don't know how to handle this, so I'm just gonna toss it to the side. Uh, you know, what can you do? Well, you can, get a little, that's where a little creativity and innovation comes in. And you can say, well, I want you to craft, I want you to start this C data, right, uh, with start, and then end it there, and then or create another entity called uh, end, uh, and then another one that has all, and then within all, include this right here, right? So now I have, um, now, this is exactly what it will look like, right? So XML knows C data is just execute this right here. So file Etsy slash F stab. Um, and then parse it uh, down here. So put all of this together, right? Uh, it's not as clean as what I did before, but it, it's, it is a way to, to manipulate your XML parser to give you what it is that you're looking for, right? Um, 
Next, uh, you know, again, XML parsers can break if they don't understand characters they encounter in your files. If it's a PHP uh, based web application, you can base64 encode it, which is how I was able to get the SE slash password file, especially with those slashes back or backwards or forward slashes. One of the slashes to, to get through, right? And you got the example in the demo. Um, so now, how do we detect slash prevent? So uh, in talking to a lot of blue teamers um, and, and just in my own experience, I've, I've kind of gotten more from let's keep the bad guys out uh, to a mindset of keep the bad guys out to detecting, uh, detecting bad guys or in malicious users or, or whatever. Uh, and with that, I've, I've thought about it and I was like, well, adversaries have something that traditional people and just generally everybody don't have. We, they have more time, they have more energy, and they have more resources. So I, for one, am juggling like six or seven different projects right now. And whereas this adversary might only have one project and it's me, right? So whereas they can dedicate 12, 16 hours a day to my, one of my projects, I can only dedicate maybe 45 minutes a day. Um, so again, they have energy, time, and resources that I don't have. So with that being said, I'm focusing more on prevention. How can we, or, or excuse me, detection. So how can I detect, right? So everybody's heard the stat, uh, you know, adversaries are typically in your network 200 plus days, right, before being, being detected. Uh, well, how do I get that number down from 200 plus to 90, to 30, to 30 minutes, right? So how can I, how can I get such a well-oiled machine that is my network and my applications and my stuff um, down to that level. Well, for this particular case in XXE, the first thing you can do is disable the use of external entities, right? Um, if you're developing custom-made XML applications uh, or custom applications that utilize XML to transport data so they could talk to one another, um, I really don't see a need for you to have external entities hosted on someone's GitHub page. Right, um, you know, take that little due diligence and just say, well, if I have to use external, then make it internal. Right. Um, the 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 next one is verify that the XML or the XSL, which is um, uh, file upload functionality. So if you do have a file upload functionality in your web app, um, is is income it uses it validates uh, the incoming XM, XML with the uh, XML schema definition. Right. So your, what, what your application is expecting to receive is actually what it's receiving. Um, so that's a, you know, that's just an XML way of input validation, right? Um, and in last, patch and upgrade your XML parsers using one of the underlying, uh, or in the underlying OS um, with the latest version. So PHP 5, if you can support it, uh, go to PHP 7 if you tested it within your web apps, right? Um, OWASP has a super awesome list that continues to grow um, on how to defend against XXE um, in a wide range of applications. Java, PHP, there's even iOS um, that OWASP has covered, right? Um, so now for the blue teamers and for the red teamers in the room to kind of get a general, a little bit better understanding in what your defenders are actually doing and thinking about, um, how about any content type headers coming across text or XML uh, or application in XML when they should be JSON, right? So typically um, what I found in my research and just talking and reading other people's work is that a way of getting around um, or, or exploiting these web apps is if they're accepting JSON, right? So it's super simple just to change the header information and see if it accepts XML. Um, most of the time it does. Um, any outbound requests from your web server or web app that you shouldn't, right? So that's a kind of a self-explanatory one. Uh, if, like, why is my web server talking to IP address directly? Like, you know, hard-coded IP address. Um, or, um, you know, a random, random uh, domain name, right? So my web server should only be used for file uploading, it should not be talking to anything outside my internal network, right? Um, 
is there any use of Base64 in your environment, right? So this one can kind of vary. So um, working as a, a SOC analyst, I saw uh, we would see Base64 stuff come across, right, instantly in, in one of our rule sets, it would flag. Uh, I go investigate, decode it. It's a PowerShell script to upload a remote server somewhere, right? And they're just like straight, pure, go out to Windows and update yourself. Right, and it's like, why are you, <laughs> why are you the administrator, like base 64 encoding your updates, you know, just go out, right? Like, uh, you know, that's a little suspicious. Um, uh, and then is your parser accessing directories and files that it shouldn't, right? So if you don't limit, why is your um, web server that doesn't have any login authentication whatsoever, there's nothing to log into, there's no portal, uh, why is it accessing the Etsy password file, right? Or why is it accessing areas of your own server that you shouldn't really be paying attention to? Or, or it shouldn't even be touching, excuse me, not paying attention to, that's bad language. Um, you know, like the root directory, why is your web server going to the server root directory, not the web root directory, right? So, uh, with that in mind, um, let's move into the red, blue, and purple teams and how they can actually use it. So we kind of just covered the red teams um, and we covered the blue teams. So um, there's not a lot of offensive security people in this talk and that's because it's not really sexy, right? Uh, XXC is not a, you know, it's not gonna get me root, it's not gonna get me shell immediately, it's not gonna, um, you know, it's not gonna give me that RCE. You're not gonna see, uh, you know, in today's age, it's been around for, you know, at least a decade now, this exploit, um, you're not gonna see, you know, $50,000 bug bounties go out for this type of deal, right? Um, but there are some pretty cool research that has been done um, to show that this can be done, this exploit can be used in, you know, more than one way of just like, give me a shadow file, give me a password file. This is, it can be used more for, you know, like, uh, enumerating an internal network that you otherwise can't, right? It could be a, you might have to send a lot of XML files to this thing for it to parse and execute and such. Um, but you, I think you'll be surprised at, at you know, the, the what you can do um, with, with this and utilizing this. Really, it's more about your imagination, right? So um, through the red team's eyes, this can be used in an adversarial engagement. Uh, it can be used for intelligence gathering, obviously. Um, it can be used for threat modeling, right? So if you're dealing with a web app, why not throw this on your threat model and see if it's ex you know, uh, ap applicable, right? Um, vulnerability analysis is kind of the same thing, and then exploitation and post-exploitation, right? So it can be used in all of these manners um, that we've already previously discussed. Again, less likely to find RCE. Um, it's more for, it's more mostly used for file inclusion and pivoting to other systems. Right, so I'm able to get in through the web server this way, and then I'm gonna move to uh, your database server, whatever, whatever else is your target, right? It's more of a, as a way in and a lay of the land, right? So it's kind of I'm a passing through. Um, you're limited in options for exploiting web apps through XXC given the protocols that, that you're using. Um, there are other ways, you just need creativity, right, and innovation. Um, so this is where you get to put your fun hat on and say, hmm, I wonder what else I can do, right? So again, let's talk about more about the blue team's eyes, right? So 200 days, how do we get it down? Um, well, we can use the OODA loop, of course. So observe, orient, um, make a decision, and then act. So acting is important, but only if you do it in the right way, right? So sometimes you obviously don't wanna kick people out of your network immediately, because then you'll never really know what their true intentions are. Right, so I recently just finished reading a book called The Cuckoo's Egg, and if you never read it, it's by Cliff Stoll. Uh, I highly recommend that you guys take a look at it and, and check it out. Um, it's a pretty simple read. It doesn't go way down in the weeds. Um, it's an astronomer that wrote this book, right? So um, he's, uh, it's, it's pretty good, and there's even, I found surprising today that it's even applicable, a lot of the lessons learned in this book and how much it applies today from good, taking good documents uh, chain of custody and your logs and such, um, you know, just <laughs> really an understanding of how the federal government works and the various agencies and how they still today don't work as well as they could together. Um, so I encourage that. 
But getting back to this, so you see here that we were using Base64 to encode our uh, results back from this web server, right? So ways that we can, you also saw that if I saw that in the clear, I can just snatch that, decode it myself, and say, oh, I know what they got. I now know where to go. But what if I were to encode that 64, then encode that 64, and then encode that 64, then encode that one, right? Um, there's research shows that the more that you encode something, the more uh, the exponential, the size will go each time, right? Um, and if you're already operating on an extremely limited network with a lot of latency, right, moving a three, three meg file, five meg file, um, might not be the best way forward, especially with text, right? So um, with, you, you encode, so this is just one example that, that I thought of, um, but the, obviously the more you encode it, the bigger the size and the stronger you're gonna get caught, right? So again, blue team, that's another way of looking at it. So XXC through the eyes of the purple team, right? So for my next, I have a lot of candy. So for my next candy, who can tell me what purple teaming is? Mix between blue and red. Come pick your candy choice, right? Uh, so um, X to C through the eyes of the purple team, right? So we'll just start in the blue. So blue teams, mostly focus, uh, obtain situational awareness of your environment, right? Networks, hardware, devices, um, users, user skill levels, you know, organization, doesn't, you know, the full nine yards. Uh, your key thing is to detect, investigate, analyze, and mitigate, prevent the threat, whatever the threat is. Right, could again, it could be hardware, it could be people, uh, it could be anything. Um, and then understand, evaluate, and then mitigate the risk, right? So that's really where your blue team comes into play, is mitigating that risk uh, to the business owner um, of, of your, your organization. And then red teaming goes a lot different, it goes a lot deeper, um, excuse me, than just ones and zeros, right? So who can tell me what the net or where the term red teaming came from? Who wants to take a guess? Tiger teams? No, it, it goes it goes way deeper than that. Way further back. Communism. Com well, further than that. <laughs> There's no permanent revolution here. Well, deeper than that. A red book? A little red book? Ooh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> maybe. So, uh, so. Um, red teaming, uh, the term red team comes down, comes from um, the back in early Catholic days, like when the Catholic Church ruled the world. Um, it, for, for sainthood, for people who were going up for sainthood, um, and the cardinals would come together and they would discuss amongst themselves who would be deemed a saint, uh, it was in the view of the Catholic Church that everyone gets a voice to include the devil. Right, so the term red team, or that term devil's advocate, that's where it comes from. So that per there was one person and that person's sole job was to try to discredit every single act that that person did to deny them sainthood. Um, you're acting as the adversary, that's where the term red teams come from, right? So um, there's no ones, there's no zeros, ones and zeros wasn't probably around then. I wasn't there, I don't know, but I'm assuming. Um, but uh, red teaming itself is, is significantly deeper. It's, it's so much more deeper. There's, there's physiological um, aspects of it. There's sociological aspects, right? So viewing a problem from an adversary or competitor's perspective, right? Um, utilizing alternative analysis and again, acting as devil's advocate. Purple team, man which is perfect because I have a blue dot and a red dot and they make purple when mixed together, right? Um, so purple team is used to demystify each other's operations, right? So in a lot of environments, red team goes off and does red team things and then they do red team stuff and they, and then the blue team goes off and does blue team things and they do blue team stuff, right? And it's this cat and mouse game where the cat and mouse never meet ever. Right? like physically never meet in the same room. And if they do, it's typically the red team and they're leaning back because they got their feet on their table saying, you know, we got you, here's a report, here's how you keep us out, 
we'll check back in six months, right? Um, where where Purple Team comes into play is when you say, all right, I'm gonna pair a blue team member, a defender, with a red team member, an offensive person, um, and piece them together. And I'm gonna let um, both of them come to the table with their own playbooks and let them just execute their playbooks. And then they communicate with each other, right? So it's this environment where it's okay um, to say, I don't know, to say, here's what I'm doing, right? I may not show you my entire playbook, uh, but I'm gonna show you the vast majority of it, right? So that you can get a better understanding of what I see and where I come from um, on both sides, right? So you've got your blue team person saying, well, I see you ran this attack. I'm showing this net flow data. I'm showing this peak, I, I captured this PCAP. I'm doing these things. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm, here's my indicators that I'm popping off on. Here's, here's what I'm getting from this attack. Or I'm not seeing any of this, man, can you teach me more about this so I can learn to detect this type of stuff, right? Um, it enhances communication flow between your two teams. So it's this iron sharpens iron mentality. Uh, and, you know, coming from the Army, communication is everything, right? Especially on the battlefield. So um, the greatest way to cause chaos and mayhem is to prevent uh, two members of the same team just kill their communication and they can't communicate, especially as an officer in a commander level when I have to maneuver my people on the battlefield and I can't communicate to them to direct the fight, that becomes a huge, huge problem for me, right? So um, putting these two people together side by side and, and making them communicate with each other will only make, in my opinion, your organization better if they both come with a good attitude. Now, if they come with a bad attitude, then, you know, other than a heavy hand, you will do this. You know, there's no, no way else. But again, that's counterproductive if you go down that rabbit hole. Um, and then each element gains valuable skills since he's behind the curtain of the others, right? So red teams learn blue team TTP or tactics, techniques, procedures. They're learning blue team products. Um, they're learning how can I take these tools that you use and then mimic them in my own environment to create my own test cases as I test my own stuff, right? And the flip side, blue team sees these red team tools, Mimi cats, right? All these other, and, and the vast majority, doulas, they should include that in their library, right? But they can go back and take a look at it and say, well, it's creating this payload or it's creating this thing, right? So maybe we need to be on the lookout for this stuff. Um, I'm not creating a signature for the tool, I'm creating a signature for the action, right? Um, so, with that, what are your questions? Does anybody have any questions? We have like 10 more minutes. I can just stare awkwardly at everybody. <laughs> I have a lot of candy too. Nothing. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? Um, so PHP is my test case. I, I didn't test uh, IIS, so um, my ignorance is showing. I really don't know anything about IIS um, other than Microsoft owns the market. Um, so uh, I, I have, so th this web server is running Apache on it. Um, so I guess what might help, um, it is PHP, right, but going, <coughs> Do I have internets? I think I have internets. Um, can you guys see that? Yeah, cool. Um, so, man, am I missing it? Um, uh, try and, here you go. So um, OWASP cheap seat, right? So in a lot of these, it's really 
Um, it's for, for, for a lot of these, it's, it's pretty simple. You're really just like adding one line to your config file and say, don't allow DTs or um, analyze certain things, right? Only allow these things, right? Um, OWASP, again, did a pretty good job of like highlighting those and say include this to prevent this, obviously, if you can. Um, so in, in regards to testing like Java applications and other stuff, I haven't gone that far um, in, in testing. It's most definitely on our roadmap, me and, Mil me and Donald's roadmap. Um, but that's a pretty good question. Uh, PHP was just the, the base case because it's what I've been playing with lately. You get a candy again if you want more candy. Cool. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so for the viewers at home, the question was for purple team, is there a way to capture blue team stuffs and red team stuffs during an engagement? Um, and if there was a commercial product that did that? As far as I know, there isn't. Um, however, there's nothing saying that you can't, if you do an engagement with a red team and a, and a blue team, to say beforehand, um, you guys are gonna do packet captures on your stuff um, you guys are gonna, you know, produce your artifacts um, after the fact. Um, you know, we're gonna, I mean, PCAPs don't lie, right? So if you're just gonna do full packet captures of your stuff, which obviously you would need the support size and or the data set or the data storage just to support these huge PCAPs you're gonna generate, um, and then go through, right? So an actual automation, I'm sure that there is. Um, that can do that piece, but it's not automated. So maybe you just came up with a new business <laughs> right in this room in my talk you heard it here first <laughs> right um, may maybe I, I as far as I know no um, so this is again relatively new and I use quotes because it's been around for you know many 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 years it's just people are now starting to adopt it so it's more it's more instead of um, you know a new niche market it's more of a um, you know a leadership management perspective to kind of just get your teams collaborating to make them sharper and make them and make your organization better, if that makes sense. So really, again, in a long way, a long-winded way about, it's up to each team really to provide those artifacts. And maybe your purple team can be your, you know, your white cell, for, for lack of a better word, the person that goes in between and compiles it and then generates the report with representatives from each side to kind of recreate your whole timeline. Maybe that's it. So if you figure out a way to automate that, yeah, go for it. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah. So so the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a it's a framework created by MITRE um, that targets Windows environments. So we have the internet. We have the internet. Yeah. Um, spoke about that like two years ago. I can't believe I didn't think of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right here? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, man, they've really cleaned up this website. Last time I was here, it was like a wiki. Um, so you see uh, you have initial access execution. So if we just click on initial access, right? These are all the techniques that you can do um, initial access. So really, they created this wiki that uh, MITRE created this wiki through a lot of research that says um, here are all the ways you can attack a network. Here are all the ways that you can exploit a network or, or application or whatever, right? And then broken down by um, these things like initial access. So you do drive-by compromise. So within drive-by compromise, it gives you all this data, um, you know, all everything you could ever care to know, along with examples in the wild. So APT 19, 32, 37, right? The list goes on. And then a whole bunch of resources about it, right? So this is an awesome tool for your blue teamers to really look at to say, well, I'm supposed to be looking for stuff. What do I look for? Well, this is a great place to go look at. 
Um, you're not only going to get ideas on how to create your signatures and everything, but you're also going to learn the TTPs of your adversary and your offensive people. Um, and in Red Teamers, this is a great way um, to kind of add more stuff to your playbook and more like your more to get more skills if you haven't been exposed to these things before as well. So yeah, thank you for that. That's awesome. You can get a candy if you want to. I know that's what you've been waiting for. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Um,